So, there's this thing. And what I was planning on doing originally was, um, you know, I was going to make a video on a particular article. But it seems like in the last couple of days or so, there has been a lot of news. A lot of news to cover. Um, a lot of different things that... Uh, Like, there's no way I could sit here and make, like, ten videos. One on a particular topic, and then move on to the other. I'd have, like, zero time to do anything throughout my day. But I am going to try to bring to you guys in one fail swoop. So, I am going to start off with... Um, here is a tweet. Breaking. Paris protesters have stolen and got their hands on at least one assault rifle from a police vehicle and set large buildings on fire in central Paris as intense riot continues into the night. Police uh, and union sources. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So Paris... Um, Supposedly, they have been protesting because of um, because of a so-called gas tax. Now, in California, uh, the price of oil actually would be a lot less, right? Um, but the thing is, we have state and local taxes. And that is not good. That adds to the cost for the consumer, and we pay more. So, um, I can understand where they're coming from. I can't imagine uh, American people, especially now, my generation, or I have disavowed myself from the millennials because I grew up around a lot of older people who kind of had a better grasp on the world, how things work. Gas actually would probably be half as much, ex uh, half as expensive um, if it did not have government uh, involvement. So in California, gas is still technically like three three plus dollars I don't know it's like 325 ish sometimes even a little bit lower depending on where you go but that's after the reduction in the cost of oil substantially per barrel um, so I I'm not sure what angle is being worked right now but it's definitely uh, an interesting one uh, moving on to um, the uh, this is one that I saw um, today and um, you know it's basically uh, it's Ben from suspicious observers he is uh, is a firm believer in uh, the electric universe and basically he's saying here that um, he's staking his entire reputation on February 16, 2019, talk at OTF 2019. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, something in the frontier. I can't think of it on top of my head. I will demonstrate that every climate study is flawed and none of the scientists made any math errors. I will demonstrate the necessity of the rewriting, of rewriting every single climate study ever done staking entire rep on this claim so um, he's a firm believer that climate isn't man-made basically and climate is uh, controlled by the very thing that um, our ancient ancestors 
worshipped as the as the greatest of the gods, if you will. Aside from all the other planets, the number one force, uh, the number one factor on this planet is the sun. Nothing grows without the sun. Nothing gets warmer without the sun. Humans and all life would cease to exist without the sun. The sun not only controls the climate on our planets, but also affects every other planet in our solar system and probably beyond. Probably not as much, but definitely in our solar system. I can go into a three hour video on that, but right now I'm going to continue on and just bring this to your guys' attention. Excuse me. That alternative, I shouldn't say alternative science, it's either right or it's wrong. And in this case, um, I would have to put my uh, eggs in this basket. This Ben uh, from Suspicious Observers has some of the greatest science videos um, that you know are available for free that you can watch every day almost every day he makes a video regarding what's happening with our sun our star and our solar system what's happening to our planet and much much more but check his page out follow him at the real s o's um this is a tweet that i saw that i i, I love this guy he it's so simple it's such a simple account taxation is theft and he just posts the national debt at that time and what's funny is so he's posting the national debt right and yet even with all the taxes that's our debt it makes no sense it's unbelievable now this is a video that I had seen earlier and um, this is BB News World it says, all over the world, there are people who are suffering as a consequence of climate change whose voices have not been heard. Sir David Attenborough tells BBC after a speech to UN Climate Conference. So this was today, right? And there was probably a lot of people who've seen this video. But the thing is, listen to what he says at the end. Allow that to happen. Because up until now, progress in the negotiations has been incredibly slow. Is there anything that you might have said that could change that, do you think? I don't know, but my feeling, that there was a sense of urgency uh, this morning, I thought, in, in, the, in the assembly. I'm not an experience, I've been to one before, that's all, which was the Paris Agreement. But there was a real sense of, 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 of impending disaster and, and needing to take action right now. And the fact that the, uh, the World Bank announced here that they were doubling the amount of money that was going to be available for, for this particular problem. World Bank announces they're doubling the funding. What? Was, uh, was a real statement. I mean, it, it was, it, I thought it was something that should make us gulp and say, yes, well, people are taking notice of what's happening. To them. Not before time, but they are. Um, doubling the, uh, the amount of money that they're going to be doing for this. First of all,
what? How is it that every single country in the world is in debt? They don't have money to spend on their own people. There's riots in France because of high gas taxes. Imagine what else is going on in the world that we don't even think about that is being taxed. We are at a point where government is so big that it's literally out of control. Okay? The chaos that you see in Paris is only the beginning. Okay? First it starts in France, and then it goes to Europe. And then once it goes to Europe, and the commerce between Europe and the rest of the world gets disrupted, then other nations will begin to recoil because of the, uh, the economic stress on the individual liberty of the people that live in those countries. Once it reaches America and England uh, and even places in the Middle East, you're looking at some serious problems. And when I say serious problems, I mean it we're dragging civilization down into an abyss. Okay? The same kind of of abyss that existed during a world war. Now, do I know who those people are protesting in France? No. Are they probably national, uh, you know, people that live there? Yeah, they probably are. Number one, they're facing a migrant crisis. And number two, they're having to deal with Macron, which um, if you look into his backstory, he originated from uh, the Rothschild banking. And I always find myself going back to talking about the Dana Rothschilds. As far as I'm concerned, you know, I don't really care about the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds supposedly have this magical, you know, wand that they um, that they swing around and, and move markets and do all this. I don't think that's true. Um, a lot of people do, but I don't. I just think that they're more of a boogeyman than anything. But, uh, anyways, so they doubled the money, okay? They doubled the money, and it seems like a lot of Europe is suffering right now. Uh, I think the only places that are really able to, that are going to be able to withstand, um, are the United States. Uh, we'll see what happens with China, and... Russia and a lot of the Middle Eastern countries. I don't know why Europe is suffering so bad. I I just don't see how anyone, including globalists, could do this to an entire continent. Because it's like at the last second when we elected Donald Trump, he grabbed America by the shirt and swam to the surface after driving off a cliff which by the way technically speaking we're still falling we're still drowning and Donald Trump is still swimming 
We haven't even made it to the surface. Okay. We took a ride on, um, you know, David Hasselhoff, like in the SpongeBob movie, when we got two Supreme Court justices. But other than that, we're still swimming. Um, here's another one from Reuters World. It says a UN climate meeting comes as the World Meteorological Org Organization warned that global temperatures were on course to rise by five, or excuse me, three to five degrees Celsius, which is up to nine degrees Fahrenheit this century, Oversh overshooting a global target, limiting the increase to, to two C, which I think is only like three degrees. Now, the thing that blows me away about this is that if you look at the climate models for winter this year so far, we've been like 7 degrees below average Fahrenheit. What does that tell you? Okay. First of all, Uh, this year, in the next, like, two years, you're going to find out global warming is a total sham. And I hope people that watch this understand that that is the case. Um, here's one from Bloomberg Opinion. Apparently, why do they have a Bloomberg Opinion? Trump gave uh, Xi a small concession at Buenos Aires, but he is likely to keep bashing China until it gives in. In order to win, the Chinese will need to be very patient. Uh, this article... Um... Let's see here. It is appropriate that Donald Trump and Xi Jinping are flying to Buenos Aires for their showdown summit at the close of the month that began the centennial of the end of the First World War. America's economic tussles with China are all too reminiscent of the rivalry at the beginning of the last century between Britain, the superpower, and the rising power, Germany. This is not as bleak a comparison as it sounds for two reasons. First, nobody now seems to be planning on imminent armed conflict, partly because of the awfulness of nuclear weapons and partly because of the terrible lessons of the 20th century. Instead, the main threat is of an economic iron curtain dividing the world's two biggest economies. Now keep that in mind because we also have two, or we're in the works of, two separate internets, okay? And this is big because, first of all, the fact that we were ever given one in the first place is absolutely amazing. And now we have two. One that has nothing to do with anything, and the other that promotes freedom at least for now um this is not a blah 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 uh second history also shows how you can get out of trouble for all the worries about tasud i don't even know how to say that the phrase coined by harvard's graham allison to describe the depressingly frequent record of conflict Whenever an established superpower is challenged by a rising one, some historians think one, fe one feature of the First World War was its av avoidability. There was no set course that led inevitable, uh, inevitably from the Austrian Archduke being assassinated in Sar Sarajevo in June 28, 1914 to millions dying in the trenches. After all, Britain and Germany, and of course France, Russia, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and dealt 
with nationalist crisis before uh, and hung into onto peace. They just failed a deal with a particular outburst. No country can learn more from looking back than China. That is partly a matter of temperament. The Chinese are fixated, fixated by history and they read books. For instance, Wang Qishan, China's vice president, will happily uh, discuss Alexis de uh, Tocqueville, uh, Stefan Zwag, Zwag, I don't know how to say these names, in the Hundred Years' War, confronted with that list Trump would guess you were referring to a character Joan Collins played in Dynasty. Whatever. Obviously biased towards China. But there is also a practical reason for China especially to look back in the lead up to World War I. Every European power made mistakes, but if only one century was a little more culpable than the others, it was it was possibly Germany. The rising power never understood the consequences of its militarism, never grasped the resentment of it its economic rise was causing, and found itself short of friends. Many would say China and Germany have been too alike for comfort, but there is a way out. To escape blah blah blah's trap, uh, patience and popularity count for a lot. Now if they're referring to China, popularity, uh, I don't think anyone in America or even in European countries fucking like China, okay? Excuse my French. Nobody likes China. Nobody likes China to the point where we're literally giving them a second internet to stay the fuck out of ours. Okay, that's not really why they won't censor their citizens and uh, you know put them in gulags and shit. Uh, moving on though, for instance, Chinese officials seem perplexed. Why haven't American companies rushed to defend the multilateral trading system against Trump's rampages? The answer is fairly simple. Western CEOs are privately fed up with the way China treats them. The artificial barriers, the ownership restrictions, the intellectual property theft and the repeated delays in opening up markets. Anything Trump can do to, pri uh, to prize open China is welcome, as long as he does not go too far. So this was really the part of the article that uh, I wanted to talk about the most. And that is, China has a very closed market. They're very protectionist, and rightfully so. If we were more like that, we would have, you know, we wouldn't have Japan dominating our motor vehicle uh, markets. We wouldn't have South Korea dominating our technology market. We wouldn't have, um, you know, Mexico or uh, Indonesia dominating our clothing uh, manufacturing our production for the cl for our clothing. Um, we wouldn't have you know Taiwan and all these other countries that have been outsourced, dominating our production. And the one thing that really um, kills me is China doesn't allow any of those countries to compete. In their market, and I think the United States, honestly, if we were allowed access to to Chinese market, we could produce something effectively and efficiently enough to where um, it would cost less for us to manufacture here because of the abundance. There was a video that I saw. It was the head of the BRICS bank. I, it's actually the first video I ever put out, talking about how China buys 250 million bicycles okay 250 million that's more um, that's like half the population of America on bikes 
okay? Imagine when they go to buy cars. Even if we squeaked by, if we squeaked by in there for like a couple years while these, uh, while the Chinese millennials or whatever, they're buying their first car, get into a, you know, a Ford or whatever. They like Buicks over there, but, um, my point is, all those, uh, all those cars are probably going to be all Chinese cars, and they will never have American-made cars, or Japanese, or whoever, which is kind of sad, because I can't imagine not being able to have the opportunity to buy these things. If I go in, obviously, I, I own a Ford. But if I wanted to go buy like a Honda or, you know, Acura or whatever the hell it is, um, I have that opportunity. Whereas China, they don't have that opportunity. And it's, it goes the same for a lot of things, you know, when, you know, what, it's almost like what happens in China stays in China, but everything happens in China and therefore everything stays in China um, I just hope he's able to open up the market that's all I care about because then you know somebody can open up a up a business and export um, I'm going to continue on this last portion of this article here. It says, however, there are two promising signs that China is becoming more skillful. First, China's rhetorical defense is increasingly anchored in the multilateral system. Even a year ago, China seemed bent on replacing the Western Bretton Woods institutions set up at the end of World War II with regional bodies of its own creation. But at the month's Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit, she specifically called for countries to uphold a rules-based order led by the World Trade Organization, and in recent weeks he has condemned the law of the jungle and beggar thy, beggar thy neighbor policies, and warned about globalization being at a crossroads. Second, China increasingly stresses that opening up its economy is in its own interest. Earlier this month, she promised to import 30 trillion dollars worth of goods and China has promised to push ahead much more quickly with opening up industries including financial services so I'm guessing I'm guessing 30 trillion dollars worth of goods is I mean, how vague can you get? Because thirty trillion dollars in a yuan, or yuan, or whatever the fuck it's called, I don't know. Is that really that a lot? Like, I mean, that's probably like the twenty billion dollars in U.S. dollars. I don't know, but thirty trillion. It's got a dollar sign right there. Thirty trillion. So, I mean, that's a big number. I don't even know how that's possible. Of course, China has muttered about opening up before and done very little, but there is a difference now. China's economy is in transition. The next phase of its growth, officials say, will come from services and personal consumption. It would much rather suck in foreign capital than add yet more debt and government stimulus. And talking about the benefits of opening up China gives Xi more room to retreat gracefully. Domestically, he can portray concessions to Trump as, as long-promised reforms that will make China stronger, which is probably true anyway. There is a, u a useful prompt for this with another historical echo. December 18th is the 40th anniversary of the third uh, plenary session of the 11th Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, which was the moment in 1978 Deng Xiaoping started opening up China's economy. She is likely to unveil a series of commemorative reforms 
Reform banks that have been waiting to take bigger stakes in their Chinese joint ventures may well find the approval process is sped up. So China is going to have to open up their economy because no longer are they the cheapest manufacturing in the world. A lot of the people made a shit ton of money, you know, in the early 80s, you know, the whole 1984 thing. Um, and then onward, they've been just basically, the, it's been a factory for the world. And so now that they're opening up their economy to other countries is going to allow for uh, all these people to have all this money to invest it in um, basically the world. Because a lot of that money already leaves because people go visit other countries that are in China who have kajillion dollars. They just go and they spend money, um, you know, vacationing or whatever. So that article, to me, was one of the more interesting ones uh, that... I found now the last but not least I say last but not least um, Qatar so Qatar decided that it would um, it would remove itself from OPEC next month and now, Qatar, in this article, it says that um, it says that uh, effective January 1st, they will be leaving. The decision comes amid standoff with Saudis and pressure from Trump. Uh, Qatar said it will leave OPEC next month, a rare example of the toxic politics of the Middle East, rupturing a group that held together for decades through war and sanctions. Qatar, a member since 1961, is leaving to focus on its liquefied natural gas production. Industry Minister Saad Sharida Al Kabi. So um, this is actually interesting because Qatar is under like what the hell you call that? It's like a blo it's been blockaded by Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia gets to choose, uh, you know, what comes in and what goes out. I work in the industrial gas side of things, and I follow a lot of the industrial gas um, news that comes out. And supposedly, because of the blockades uh, of Qatar, which they are, they are the world's, or at least one of the biggest producers of helium. I, excuse me. They're the number one producers. Are they capture helium? And excuse me. And the helium prices are astronomical right now. I mean, if you wanted to get some balloon grade helium, you can't even buy it. You can't even go to a store and buy helium. Um, sometimes. You can go to uh, Walmart and they have a little like disposable one, but even then you're going to be paying a ton of money. Um, but the hard part is is even getting it. Uh, not only is it expensive, but you have to you have to get the actual helium. So my thing is. You have Qatar who are in a standoff. They can't do anything. And so basically what they're doing right now is they're probably going to just... Um, they're probably just going to give Saudi Arabia the, uh, the share of their oil market, which I think somewhere in this article... Yeah, it says Qatar is OPEC's 11th biggest oil producer, accounting for less than 2% of total output. So, I mean, that's a very small amount. 
But if you start doing that to everybody, right? Even 2%. 2% of what? 2% of, uh, you know, probably like 10 billion or, or cent, uh, excuse me, 10 trillion or something crazy like that. I mean, it's it's insane. Qatar is like the number one. I mean, they have like the wealthiest people in the world. The Qatar. It's it's actually one of the, um, you know, most advanced. Uh, Middle Eastern countries in the world, obviously aside from Saudi Arabia. But, um, so this goes on to talk about how, um, you know, while Saddam Hussein from 1990 to 1991, occupation of Kuwait, producers still saw the benefits of retaining their membership and cooperating on oil policy. And so, you know, this actually probably will set a precedent for all the other countries that are involved in OPEC because you have three main oil producers in the world. You have Saudi Arabia, the U.S., and you have Russia. That's it. Canada is like in a cool, you know, like fourth place with, you know, nothing compared to these guys. And considering the the revolution and fracking and everything else that's going on in the U.S., we have we shot up to number one. Now, do I like oil production being that high? I don't know. To be honest, I haven't really seen a whole lot. Of, you know, nothing really changed. So, for me to say, oh, yeah, you know, this is great. I don't really know what the hell is going to happen. But what I will say is, I don't think, because fracking is so expensive, with, uh, you know, the environmental costs and everything else, I don't know how long we're going to be able to withstand this. Yeah, oil prices are low, but can we really compete with that price? Oil companies are probably losing money in the U.S., because it costs a lot of money to do the fracking procedure. So unless the government subsidizes it, right? I don't know if it's going to work. I think actually Donald Trump is shooting himself in the foot and giving more power to Russia and Saudi Arabia. That's why you saw them with the handshake, right? And I'm not, I'm not saying that they're like some, you know, they're like bros or anything like that, but, I mean, they have a serious, serious market share. And if they're able to drive the price down, right, our oil companies are not going to be able to sustain. And right now, they're making moves to push other people out of the market that originally would have been there supplying or keeping the supply at a steady pace rather than herky jerking it and raising it or lowering it whenever they want because that's the power that these people have this is this is the fuel for our economy and unless it changes rapidly which is why you see all these people out here trying to promote climate change when really they should level with people and tell them look these people control our oil prices. If we don't come up with an alternative way of fueling our vehicles or fueling our trains or whatever, we're fucked. So, just another thing to keep in mind. Um, so these apparently are the people in the OPEC. Russia... 11.8 million barrels Saudi Arabia 10.7 million uh, Iraq 4.7 million Iran 3.3 million UAE so all these ones are eventually probably going to go away right and they're going to squeeze them all out of their shares in the oil market and then they'll probably 
increase their oil production to make up for that or they will buy from these countries direct and probably for a lower price to resell it which will draw prices even lower and no alternative fuel will ever be able to compete with it and we'll have gas engine for forever Qatar was the largest exporter of LNG in the world in 2017 uh, and the US um, actually has increased its export um, to I think it's like 79 or 83 or something like that now so we would be up here at number two in the world um, which is kind of crazy so just something to keep in mind um, so the other thing that was interesting today that happened was uh, so Tumblr Tumblr decided that they were going to ban all adult content. Um, adult content has been estimated at 10 to 20 percent of the blogging services traffic and um, it says the Verizon subsidiary that owns the Yahoo and AOL digital media brands has announced that as of December 17th all adult content will be banned from the Tumblr and blogging site. Any still or moving images displaying real life human genitals or female nipples of any content even drawn or computer generated artwork depicting any sexual acts will be prohibited genitals and, f and female nipples will only be permitted within the context of breastfeeding childbirth and in health related subjects such as gender confirmation surgery I don't even want to know what that is Written erotica will also be uh, will also remain on the site. Nowadays, pornography represents a substantial element of Tumblr's content. A 2013 estimate said that around 11% of the site's 200,000 most visited, visited domains were porn, and some 22% of inbound links were from adult sites. Um, Porn has caused issues for Tumblr too. Earlier this year, Apple removed the Tumblr app from the iOS. Oh. I did not know that. Holy shit. Uh, this was because child porn had been published on Tumblr. And the filtering system the site uses to prevent such things did not catch it. So I can understand from that perspective that if they can't catch it. If they can't catch one, they're just going to get rid of all of it. Now, I don't know what it takes to put in a filter, an uh, image filter, or a video, or a GIF filter, but I can imagine it's very expensive. And Tumblr, out of the sake of not having to pay all this extra overhead, they just figured that they would let it all ride. But now, because it's causing all these problems, that, um, you know, basically they are just going to get rid of all of it and I mean it's not I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal uh, in my own opinion but a lot of people were complaining about this today there's a lot of really good memes it says I want to hold their hand tumblr stay back slut fucking butter knife I think tumblr is lashing out after all the years of abuse Scott Ed. As of December 17th, adult content will be prohibited. 90% of the site leaves Tumblr. <laughs> this president's approval rating has just hit an all-time low. His capital is in flames and overrun by violent protesters and looters. And he has asked his interior minister to prepare security forces for future violent. Hint not Trump and he's talking about Macron 
obviously, because um, the Macron uh, presidency has been nothing but absolute, I mean, ridiculousness, okay? I don't even know how he's still in office, and I really don't know how nobody has gotten to him. I pray that he lives through his term, but at this rate, I mean, literally, if you've seen some of the pictures, I mean, setting cars on fire, right? Breaking windows and buildings, looting them, robbing them. Um, I mean, it's chaos. And I don't know if this is some kind of psychological operation. I really don't. Um, but it's kind of crazy. To think that, you know, France is literally being overran by its citizens. It's a revolt. It's a, it's a, you know, vive la revolution. I mean, it's seriously happening. Will it continue? I don't know. Is it staged? I don't know. It's really hard to say. But... It's unfortunate. Let's see what, let's see what Trump's talking about today. Wow, he's been tweeting up a storm. Uh, my meeting in Argentina with President Xi of China was an extraordinary one. Relations with China have taken a big leap forward. Very good things will happen. We are dealing from great strength. But China, likewise, has much to gain if and when a deal is completed. Level the field. Farmers will be a very, be a, a very big and fast beneficiary of our deal with China they attend to start purchasing agricultural products immediately we will make the finest and cleanest product in the world and that is what China wants farmers I love you now the other thing that you have to take into consideration um, China has experienced abnormal rains um, it actually affected uh, I found an article from 2017 that was talking about how um, abnormal rains wiped out a bunch of like uh, Bitcoin miners and uh, or cryptocurrency miners and uh, when they went offline people had to literally pick up the slack like they were going crazy but anyways uh, they're having troubles farming outdoors and because the climate is not is is modified heavily over the u.s to where we don't have that problem um we uh we still have the ability to grow outdoors and this is another th problem that we're going to be seeing over the next couple of years and china knows it and it's not um it's not that China can't do anything about it because I believe that they can but it also uh, you also have to take into consideration that the US is the number one exporter for food we have a lot of food and I think with uh, Xi Jinping buying a lot of food from the US is going to help tremendously with our food prices because over the next couple of years we're going to see higher inflation which is going to basically tax us as citizens um, especially with the price of oil lowering it means less dollars are going to be in circulation or less dollars are going to be used to buy the oil whereas before because oil prices were higher more dollars are being used 
Um, President Xi and I have very strong and personal relationship. He and I are the only two people that can bring about massive and very positive change on trade and far beyond between our two great nations. A solution for North Korea is a great thing for all for China and all. So he's bringing up North Korea. I am certain that uh, at some time in the future, President Xi and I, uh, together with President Putin of Russia, will start talking about a, media, a meaningful halt to what has become a major and uncontrollable arm race. The U.S. spent $716 billion this year. Crazy. I am still shocked every day by this man. That, it, and it's so crazy. He fucking tweets this shit, and the whole world sees it. If this isn't the best tweet that you have seen in the last, or the best, uh, I guess, I don't know, uh, acknowledgement of a problem in the last 50 years, I don't know what it is. Become a major unco uncontrollable arms race. Wow. Um, we would have billions of dollars if the Democrats would give us the votes to build the wall. Either way, people will not be allowed into our country illegally. We will close the entire southern border if necessary. Also, stop the drugs. Okay. Uh, Michael Cohen asked Judge for no prison time. You mean he can do all of the terrible, unrelated to Trump things having to do with fraud, big loans, taxes, etc., and not serve a long-term prison, prison term? He makes up stories and to get a great and already reduced deal for himself and get his wife and father-in-law who has the money off scot-free he lied for this outcome and should in my opinion serve a full and complete sentence i will never testify against trump this statement was recently made by roger stone essentially stating that he will not be forced by a rogue an out-of-control prosecutor to make up lies and stories about Donald Trump. Nice to know that some people still have guts. So, <laughs> I love this because Roger Stone is, is like, he's the most rogue person I have ever seen. He hangs out on InfoWars okay all the time constantly he has told a lot of really questionable things on infowars and you know obviously for capitalistic reasons probably it was done to make money like everybody else does but the fact that he's being talked about with Donald Trump or uh, Donald Trump's talking about him obviously means that he has played a very uh, exponential role in all of this. Uh, looking forward to being with the Bush family to pay respects to President George H.W. Bush. Congratulations to a newly inaugurated Mexican President Lopez uh, Obrador. He had a tremendous political victory with the great support of the Mexican people. We will work well together in many years for many years to come. So. Um, one takeaway, though, I will say this tweet right here, I'm retweeting it because it's very, uh, I guess you can say, impressive. I am certain that at some time in the future, President Xi and I, together with President Putin of Russia, will start talking about a meaningful halt to what has become a major and uncontrollable arms race. It's amazing. Unbelievable. Anyways. That's all I got for today. Just needed to catch up on that. Get it off my chest. Figure it out. Think about it. And. 
I guess I'll see y'all in the next one.